I don't believe it. I don't know whether to laugh or cry. You are? She's on a diet, too. Nearly. This is ridiculous. Here we are, the very best restaurant in town, and none of us can eat. Well, is there anything you can eat, Mrs. Noflaw? Uh, what is your regime at noon? Nothing but what? A cold boiled. Did you say turnip? <gasps> is that something new? No. Full of vitamin Q? I hadn't got that far down the alphabet. And what does Q do for us? It does. How marvelous. Let's say you're in a theater. It's a rather large theater back in 1925. Maybe the Royal Albert Hall in London. A very large, large place. And the curtain opens and a spotlight appears on the stage. And into the spotlight, a single woman walks in and sits down in a chair there in the spotlight and begins to speak. She's playing a character. And the character begins to refer to other characters that are around on the stage. And you hear one side of a conversation that is happening between all of these characters. And by the end, you could swear that you see all of the other characters, that you see uh, those people that are speaking with this one actress. You get an impression of all the people mentioned and talked about. The person you're watching is Ruth Draper. From 1920 to 1956, Ruth Draper was a seminal force in 20th century American theater. Maybe world theater, actually, for that matter. She was a monologist, um, a recitist, meaning she gave recitals. She basically created from scratch original monologues and performed them all around the world, traveling worldwide throughout her whole career and influencing a bunch of major figures in the arts all throughout the 20th century. People that were affected by her uh, monologues and remembered her in wonderful ways include Woodrow Wilson, George Bernard Shaw, Noel Coward, um, Catherine Hepburn, Theodore Roosevelt, um, and then on into, into more recent times, Lily Tomlin, uh, Simon Callow, uh, bunch of different uh, actors. She's the kind of person that, that the people that we might know in the mainstream know about. She's like an inside baseball influence. It, kind of the way improvisers know about Severn Darden from the Compass Players and early, early Second City. But most people don't know who Severn Darden is. Severn Darden is the person that funny people believe is funny. For solo performers, uh, and if you stay in solo performance long enough, you eventually find out about Ruth Draper. Ruth Draper is the person that the people that are known for doing solo performance, like John Leguizamo, uh, Sarah Kane, uh, these people know about Ruth Draper. Anyway, I want to take a moment to talk about her influence on me and her kind of a amazing life and... Uh, lessons that you can draw about solo performance from Ruth Draper. Ruth Draper was born in 1884 in New York. Uh, her family was a society family. They were members of society and as a young kid she would make up these characters and little speeches for these characters and she would perform in salons when her mom's friends came over. Uh, when they went to other people's houses where some kids would give piano recitals or uh, read poetry, a young Ruth Draper would perform these monologues. Uh, in 1920, she went professional and um, started touring the world. And she toured all the way up until 1956, close to her death. She created a number of these really, really dynamic monologues. She only spoke as one character in the monologue, but you got the impression uh, of all the other characters by this one character speaking, which is kind of a neat little magic trick to tell the truth. Um, she stayed single her whole life. She was kind of a, a, a spinster, a, a matronly kind of figure. She, she was uh, 
very tall, very, very intelligent, very, very cultured, very, very sophisticated. Um, she's what, what we look back on and call a handsome woman. Uh, not, not a necessarily conventional beauty, but definitely striking to look at, um, which served her well in her performances um, on stage. She uh, fell in love one time in her life uh, with a, a Italian aviator. Um, and let me get his name right. Loro De Bosis. De Bosis was an activist and uh, a very handsome, young, much younger than Ruth Draper, young uh, idealist. He was fighting fascism um, in uh, Italy. And in the early 1930s, he learned to fly an airplane, and he flew the airplane over Rome, and he dropped uh, pamphlets uh, fighting the fascist uh, government. Uh, he blanketed the city in, in these. And by the time the Italian Air Force had kind of uh, rallied, he had flown off. Unfortunately, he was never heard from again. Um, nobody quite knows if his plane crashed, if he crashed into the sea. Um, uh, he just disappeared, basically. And this broke the heart of Ruth Draper. It was the only man she'd ever fallen in love with. She never loved again. Ruth Draper never published any of her monologues. Uh, she herself is the only person to perform it, and she never performed anybody else's. Um, there's a, uh, a story of the novelist Henry James writing a monologue for her, but she never performed it publicly. Uh, she preferred to perform her own work. She collected souvenirs, and she had several close friends, and she wrote letters. Uh, she has a huge collection of letters that have been collected together into books uh, over the last couple of decades since her death. Um, fascinating, fascinating journey. Um, the takeaway from Ruth Draper for me, besides being a huge innovator in the field of one-person theatrical performance, is uh, how she thought about herself. She, she was not a green M&M's type who needed to be pampered, but she did see value in what she did. So she demanded her own dressing room. Uh, she worked out the business details and was very, very shrewd on the administrative and business side of things, who was very, very well organized. In fact, one of the takeaways from reading about Ruth Draper that I was really impressed by and I implemented many years ago is she kept a gig list, a list of every time she performed and where she performed and any kind of notes about that performance. For instance, if royalty was in the audience for a particular performance or if uh, the, the box office was very, very big or very, very low, um, and I found this very, very handy. I, I have implemented this on my own website many years ago. Uh, so I have all the gigs I've ever performed back to 1994, uh, and I had to retro do it for a lot of things, but I got that idea from Ruth Draper. Um, also, uh, Ruth Draper's actual shows were very, very flexible, were very, very low tech, and she basically did the heavy lifting of the performance. Uh, it was all about the writing and the performance and not about the tech and design and costume. Um, anyway, the, the, the takeaway really is, is how she thought about herself and the fact that she worked her way up over the course of her career to be performing in very large venues like Prince Albert Hall in, uh, or the Royal Albert Hall in London that's a pretty big venue. And sometimes I think about uh, what the future of solo performance is. Uh, traditionally, uh, the people that, that in recent decades have gone into solo performance do so so it, they can basically uh, use solo performance as a launch pad into another medium. So if you think about John Leguizamo and Lily Tomlin and Whoopi Goldberg and uh, a whole slew, uh, even Anna Devere Smith, uh, Spalding Gray, a lot of these performers uh, did a solo performance, but we know them mostly because they segued into motion picture acting or television roles. Eric Bogosian was on, uh, oh, Law and Order or something for, for ages. Uh, anyway, uh, 
it became like a, a, a stepping stone. Solo performance was a stepping stone. It wasn't the end in itself. And I wonder what the future of solo performance is. I, uh, I suspect that eventually, if it, if it keeps blossoming, eventually solo performers will play stadium-sized venues again. Um, it's difficult because, of course, solo performance is intimate. It's a one-person it's, it's one show. One person is on stage talking directly to the audience. So it's very difficult uh, to scale that up to a stadium-sized thing. But then again, stand-up comedians uh, perform to stadiums uh, in very huge, huge venues. Uh, Robin Williams played The Met. Um, so... The, these kinds of, uh, you know, or, or uh, what is it, Ma uh, Madison, in New York, Madison, Madison Square Garden, Madison Square Garden. I couldn't remember the name of the, the venue for a second. That's a huge venue. Um, if solo performers uh, end up playing these venues, um, then I have a feeling people won't use solo performance as a stepping stone into another career. They'll stay with it. Um, Maybe Netflix will start running solo performances, or uh, uh, Comedy Central used to, on occasion, they would run uh, a solo performance show uh, and televise it and, and uh, broadcast it. But, but I don't see that happening much nowadays. Um, so solo performance is uh, kind of relegated off of the mainstream. I mean, theater in and of itself is not necessarily as mainstream as it used to be. But in particular, solo performance, which is a subset of theater already, is, is very far off of uh, the mainstream. But it doesn't have to be. It has a lot to offer. And there's a lot of lessons we can learn from uh, Ruth Draper about solo performance. So I, I highly recommend you, you check her out. I will put um, uh, a little bibliography note down in the uh, description about the uh, Vanity Fair article and maybe you can find it online or in an old issue of Vanity Fair. And I'll also uh, list some books uh, about Ruth Draper. Uh, Dorothy Warren wrote a pretty good book um, uh, about her. And uh, she's a fascinating character. If you're interested in solo performance, she is definitely somebody to know about. Anyway, until next time. Children, quiet, please. Will you stop this racket? Charlie, shut that window down. Because I don't want any more cold air because I've got a very bad cold and a very bad headache. I don't want any drafts. Shut the door, please. Shh. Children, will you please stop this noise and this whispering and giggling? What is so funny? Well, I also like to laugh. Will you tell me what is funny? I also will laugh. Well, there's nothing funny about us. Sit down, please. Come quickly to your places.